you know what, while we're waiting for that maybe too. Is that, yeah, sorry. Man, when Mark announced 13,000, honestly, Harriet and I are, man, overwhelmed isn't even the words that we can even come up with. Um, man, I just wish the Basodios could be like up in the bleachers just having watched you guys pour out your love, hard work, sharing so generously, uh, far and above and beyond anything that we were even anticipating. Um, wow. Um, Thank you seems trite. But I know listening to you, I know and, and having visited with you guys, your love for the Lord Jesus, your desire to be involved, not just overseas, but even locally here. God bless you and increase your tribe and your circle of influence as you live for the Lord Jesus. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I was reminded as I was sitting there, the Basodios have wondered, George, what on earth are you doing back in America? Well, I'm trying to train the next generation of missionaries. Well, where are they? <laughs> they keep saying, well, because they always hear America is so big, there's so many Christians and so on. But um, your testimony, and I took pictures of the auction, and I'll have to explain that to them, um, what, what that is. It'll be a little hard for them to understand, but they will know, as I shared in Sunday school, that you guys shared from the sweat of your brow. There's no money trees here. Um, there's no pots at the end of any rainbow, but you guys have worked hard for years and you've shared generously far and above and beyond anything that Harriet and I were even asking or thinking. Um, and so I want them to know uh, the white man, he gets calluses too. The white man goes to bed with body aching. The white man too has stress. He too has bills to pay. He too gets sick. He too loses loved ones to cancer and so on. And um, yeah, but again, focused on serving the Lord Jesus. So yeah, they're going to hear about you guys uh, once we have an opportunity to share with them. Okay, so we've been meeting these last few days about um, finishing the race and completing the task. <clears throat> and I was delighted when I heard from Josh that that was the theme. Anybody can start. Easy to start. It's finishing that matters. And that's the thing that the Lord uh, keeps pressing home to Harriet and I even. Um, we can get tired, can't we? Uh, looking for the honorable discharge. Oh, man, Lord, can I just kind of wind down and cruise in? <laughs> um, I have to admit, one time I thought, man, Harry, you know what? Every time I see those Walmart greeters, <laughs> that looks like an enviable job. <laughs> but I guess they don't even have them now. I was thinking about that one time, and I thought, man, is, is that a return? Man, how easy would that be? And then I read in the paper where a guy said that to some pregnant lady walking in, and she started choking him, this 70-year-old man. And so it, you know, they had to call the cops and everything. So I thought, man, even being a Walmart reader is not even safe. <laughs> she must have been on edge, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay, so the Apostle Paul, one of our heroes. Hey, by the way, for you who were here, was it um, Saturday night we shared how we taught, how we began in Genesis and unfolded the Bible? Do you remember we said that we laid the foundation with the book of Acts? The book of Acts laid the foundation for the epistles. By time we went into the book of Acts and came out the other end, the Apostle Paul was a hero in the Basodia's mind. So when we went into Romans, God, through the Apostle Paul, had their undivided attention. So they look up to the Apostle Paul. He is indeed the Apostle to we Gentiles. And in doing that, 
phenomenal servant of God, uh, to say the least, as we've been talking, and kind of the theme verse has been this one from Acts 20, where Paul in Miletus called for the elders at Ephesus, and so they came there, and they were listening to his last charge because he wasn't going to see him again. And this has been the theme verse for our conference. As Paul said, even though he knew dangers were coming, the Spirit of God assured him, you will be persecuted. You are going to suffer, even being imprisoned. Paul said, you know what? It doesn't matter, even though I know that's going to be my experience. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The love of the Lord Jesus had so captured his heart, nothing else mattered. Even persecution, even suffering, focused, a singular focus that the Apostle Paul had. <clears throat> and so we've been talking about this heart cry. I don't think and I don't believe that the Spirit of God wants to do anything less in your heart and in mine. This isn't just for missionaries. This isn't just for apostles. This is what he has called us to. And the Apostle Paul embraced the truth as he wrote to the Roman church that as it is written, those who were not told about him will see and those who have not heard will understand. That's where God's going. And we get to journey with him. He wants to use us as you guys have freely given, freely shared to help this become a reality. In fact, at the end of the book of Acts, as the apostle Paul is reasoning with the Jews and as the Jews are pushing back against what he's proclaiming from the scriptures, he ends that conversation right at the end of the book of Acts and he says this, Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. And that's the hope that you and I are participating in. Not everybody gets saved. Of course not. There are going to be those that willfully reject, yes. But there are going to be many, many that do come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have seen that firsthand over and over and over again. Not even just in our work. And, but in many other works, and not just inside of new tribes, but even outside of new tribes. And so we've been talking about the Basodios, who were formerly tribal animists, enslaved inside of a belief system that held them captive. In, in believing in all kinds of spirit beings, they believed the sun was the creator. They believed they were in regular contact with ancestor spirits. They even believed that trees were alive and that trees could shoot you with arrows and make you sick. They would commune with different spirit beings. And I've seen it firsthand, the things they would do with the witch doctor and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is they lived in fear, in bondage, in the darkness, like we talked the other night, that it was the Basodias like living in Satan's kingdom, like living in a dark cave or in a swamp, miserable. And so when they, they liken, what's it like being in God's kingdom? It's like getting to the mountaintop and feeling the refreshing breezes coming in and restoring your soul and breathing in new life and hope. And that's the way the Basodios talk of what it was like to come to the Lord Jesus. So the Basodios, once they've heard, and over time, as God had led, as we passed the baton to them, we established one church, they went on and planted three others. And that covers the entire Basodio nation. There is not a square inch where the gospel has not gone. Not a square inch. They are bold, confident witnesses because it is good news. It is good news. That's the point. The gospel is the good news. And that's what God has given us as a commission as local churches to reach our area here. Yes, if people need the gospel right here in this part of Washington, but then branching out, whether it be here in the United States or overseas, we're never going to tell the wrong person the gospel. Everyone is loved by God. 
and the Lord Jesus died for the sins of the world. The Basodios over time have also influenced, as we have been talking about, four other language groups in varying degrees as they modeled what it is to be a disciple. And in thinking about, here's, here's the thing that was coming to my mind over and over. It's through the truth of the word, as you guys hear it, as you and I hear it, responding, being a disciple, not just a convert. We're not just getting tickets to heaven, right? It's about how we live now here on earth. <clears throat> and we talked about that we observed as we proclaim truth from the word of God. We saw the Spirit of God ever so faithful, raising up shepherds. It was the Holy Spirit that began to raise up shepherds. And here's what we watched over time, where the Basodios, as they were led to Christ and disciples, so they turned and discipled others to where them as leaders, the first ones we put our hands on, they went in turn and raised up more leaders. And I got a little video clip here for you. <clears throat> that I want to show you. This is an ordination Basodio style. Now the camera is going to be a little cocked because it's the first time a Basodio is trying to use a video. <laughs> <clears throat> but this is uh, Basodio's and it's one of the guys, and I'll tell you what he's saying afterwards, what Miley is saying in this prayer of ordination. It's four existing elders in the background putting their hands on those that they have disciples Disciple and are now ordaining as pastors in the Basodia Church. Is that plugged in there? Oh, you know what? I don't know if the thing's plugged into the computer. Well, you wouldn't have understood it anyway. He was talking in Basodia. <clears throat> my, that was my bad. No, not to worry. Okay. They were um, ordaining these four new pastors. And it was interesting, as Miley prayed, he's praying to the Lord, and he's saying, Lord, we have watched these men over the last several years. We are not laying our hands on them quickly, and we are acknowledging your work in them. And we want to affirm together that we acknowledge this, that you are raising them up as your shepherds to be among your people, and that as long as we abide in humility, neither Satan nor demon nor anyone else can hinder us from walking under the protection of your authority. Wow. And here's the, what's the benchmark? First Timothy 3. The character qualities that they were looking for and watching these men over time that they had the qualifications of being true pastors among them. What was it based on? The Word of God. The Word of God and that alone. That's why there's been such an emphasis this weekend on the Word of God, the entire full counsel of God. And so as we watch the Basodios do this, you know, one of the things that came to mind, the Basodios take this super serious in terms of being a steward of the gospel, being a steward of being a true disciple. And the Basodias are, are quick to call you out if you're a fake. <laughs> now they smell it, and they see it. They, you, man, I'll tell you what, you do not get to do the used car salesman with those guys. They see right through that, and, they, and the way they tell it is you have no moral authority. Your, your life is not backing up your words. And they see right through that. And I was reminded of Tsudama, Tsudama, one of the guys there. And I'm reminded of that verse that Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Genuine leaders. And I thought about this. Guys, I've watched the Basodios as they've matured, as godly, mature Christian adults walking with God, not like babies, but as mature men. As they raised up other guys, you saw the ordination there. There was some other guys that didn't make it. And I know one of the guys who was hot and cold, hot and cold. In fact, that's the words Tsuduwama used as he was actually exhorting one of the guys that did not make the ordination because he wasn't faithful. 
He was like the mist. They, 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 they say you're like the mist, the morning mist. You're there, then you're gone. Uh, that's, that's not going to work. So I quote it what Sudawama actually said to one of the guys. He said it in a gracious, kind way, but he said it straightforward because he loved the guy and wanted to keep working with him, but he wanted to know where do you stand. And this is what he said to the guy. You're hot, you're cold, you're not a good picture. In other words, you're not a good model. No one will follow you. Do not play with this. If you don't want to do it, then step aside. Man, if you're in, you're in. But we can't play around with the things of God. You're not going to be able to shepherd the flock of the Lord Jesus. And so that's the way the Basudis, I want you to get a taste of the way that they're approaching this that God has called them to. This is a sober stewardship. So when we, we, <laughs> we feel as we pour our lives into the Basodias, man, not only are we teaching, we're being taught. And we're learning as well as we see God and they have refreshed my heart so many times. You know, I mentioned the other night, but I'm going to mention it again. An illustration comes to my mind. Um, there's gold in them there hills, lots of it. Gold mining companies from Australia have come there, and they've taught the Basodios how to pan for gold. Now, that's not a bad thing. Um, it's not wrong to have money, obviously. But Miley, one of the Basodio pastors, on one of my prior visits, he and I, well, the reason I'm telling you this story, the other day I talked to you about dandelions. Do you remember that, dandelions going on there? I want to give you more of the backdrop to that, because I don't think I mentioned this. Forgive me if I'm repeating myself. I don't, I don't think I am. One day on one of my visits going back, I'm sitting there in the house there in the village, and Mile, the Basodio pastor, he happens to walk into the house, and he sits down, and we're just chatting there at the kitchen table, and he holds out his hand, all calloused. I mean, he's working in the jungle to get his food and so on, but he's one of the pastors faithfully hiking up and down the mountains for years, ministering to believers. And as we're chatting there, he holds out his callous, dirty hand. He's dressed in rags. And he says, George, do you see that hand? And I said, yes, Miley, I see that hand. He said, I don't want gold ever to touch that hand. And do you know why? No, Miley, I don't know why. He said, because I know my heart. And I know that if gold ever touches this hand, I'm only going to want more and more and more and more. And that will pull me away from what God has called me to do in looking after his people. He said, so I don't even go near the creeks. I don't even go near the creeks, lest I be tempted to just start getting solely focused on gold and be pulled apart from being a shepherd to the Lord's people. As he is saying that, there's where that thought came to me. At the time, I was just visiting New Guinea, but I was living in Colorado Springs. When he said that, it was like a dagger that went into my heart. Because as he's talking of that kind of dedication, I was convicted of having an attitude towards my neighbor back in Colorado Springs who had a dandelion factory going on, and the dandelions were getting into my manicured lawn. <laughs> and it's like, Lord, what am I doing? I'm one, what, what in the, nothing, nothing wrong with having a nice lawn, but out of control. So it was, it was a wake up call. George, focused. I'm speaking to you through my lay. Your disciple. Yes, Lord, who's discipling who here? Learning, refreshed, rebuked. When Sudawama said this, you know what? He said it in the spirit of the Lord Jesus, who, think about it, as he was in the call of discipleship in Luke 14. Think about it. There's a crowd following the Lord Jesus. He sees this crowd following him. The scripture says he turned to those that were following him. And he started talking about, if you really want to be my disciple, he said this, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish? Not just to begin, anybody can begin to finish. 
Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. So God is working in your life today, regardless of your place in life and whatever sphere he's got you in. God is working in your life, regardless of your age, regardless of your stature or your position in society. He's working in you as a mom, as a dad, as an aunt and uncle, as a young teen, to finish. God is going to keep working in you till the end to finish, to see you conformed and me conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just for, it's not just for leaders. And so I've been thinking about this in terms of a race, and we're in a race. That metaphor is used often in Scripture. And as we think about seeing this world in a day where Islam is going nuts, we talked the other night, they, missiologists that know what's going on in North Africa, they said, man, there's a curtain coming down over Africa. Up at the beginning, up there, Morocco and some of those other uh, countries, Liberia, Nigeria, coming down. And Nigeria has a lot of Christians, but man, the curtain's coming down over Africa with Islam. Sweeping the globe. Islam's not waiting for anyone. Where's the Christian church? Where's the Christian church? They don't have good news. It is works righteousness. And in terms of knowing God, they're not thinking in terms of knowing God. That's not the way Islam approaches life. Hinduism, same thing. Buddhism, Buddhism is atheistic. They don't even believe there's a personal God. The only good news that there is is the Christian message. There is no other good news. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else is works righteousness. Everything else. That's why Paul was saying, man, to a former Pharisee, a former works righteousness man humbled by the Lord Jesus. It's not about our work. It's about his work. He's the one that's completed the work. And now, good news. That's why the Basodias went nuts when they realized we're free, forgiven. We belong to Christ now, sealed by his spirit. This is good news. He's come into our life, and there's something new that's happening. And the Basodias have wanted to, to share it with others, but we're, we're in this race. And as we're doing this race, this whole thing of perseverance and persistence. My coworker and I had this saying on our wall in the office. The race goes not always to the swift but to those who keep running, to keep going. And even the Apostle Paul, as he talked to the Corinthians, he reminded them and he said, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win, not just to participate. So how in you and I, how are we living our lives? Are you running the race to win? Whatever God has called you to, whatever he's positioned you for right now in this time in your history of your life, how are you living? How are you and I living for the Lord Jesus? Are we running to win? We're in 100%, 110%, not half-hearted, not anything like that, running the race to win. And it's a marathon. Man, this isn't the 100-yard dash, right? That's why... He also says, the author says in Hebrews, let us run with endurance the race set before us. Looking to Jesus. Focused. Focused. Looking to Jesus. Man, speaking of looking to Jesus, speaking of running a race, some of you will recall a few years back, I had a major heart attack after one of my visits to New Guinea. My main artery was 100% blocked. The Widowmaker. Cardiologist said, George, few are talking to me the next day. Thank God, man, I'm here. I, didn't, I don't feel like I have to be here. I feel like, man, this is like extra. Um, but I want to take advantage of it. But after that visit I had in New Guinea, man, that, I was actually somewhat disappointed, to be honest, because that, that visit I had was like the cherry on the top of the cake. Um, yeah, man, running, running that race. And I'm, 
I'm thinking about the privilege the Lord gave me after that time where during that time as I recovered, I actually spent months writing a verse-by-verse -verse commentary for the Basodios in their language. So I wrote a commentary as I was recouping all 22 chapters, verse by verse, expounding the book of Revelation in detail for the Basodio people. They had asked my coworker and I to come teach it. And so we did. In the summer of 2013, we went all that time, we were working on the book of Revelation, and they walked from all over the place. They had heard of future things, of course, but now we were going to go deep inside the book of Revelation. So they came from all, from all over the place. You probably can't see it too good there. Um, but the church was packed. There was even some from neighboring tribes that didn't even speak Basodio, and they wanted us to teach them um, in the afternoons in Melanesian Pidgin English, which my coworker Bob and I did. So we were gone morning and evening, 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 morning and evening. Wow! You know what? That's the only book where the Bible promises a blessing in the reading of it. As it says in Revelation there, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. The Basodios, they were coming unglued as we went down into the details, asking questions, talking about the future. But I, let me give you a few of the takeaways that the Basodios came away with. What a joy it was talking about how the story ends afresh, talking about that afresh. And one of the things that came to mind in principle was rejoicing in our sure hope. When they were reading in the scriptures, for example, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. and There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Wow! Man, in their hearts it was like a blowtorch. <laughs> Pondering and meditate. Look, we were going through this. This is all culminating. And I'm talking to Namolia, and again, we're going morning, evening, morning, evening. We're covering a lot of ground. And our church meetings are not just 30-minute sermons. And they're very interactive with Q&A questions. Basodios are taking notes, cross-referencing like wild men. And so in the afternoon when we had a break, when the Basodios would go, my coworker would keep teaching this other tribe in Revelation uh, in Melanesian Pidgin English. I asked Namolia one day, I said, Namolia, what did you do this afternoon? Oh, he said, George, wow, I've been meditating on what it's going to be like to see the Lord Jesus, what it's going to be like to finally be there with him. And here's how he said it. He said, oh, the joy, the inexpressible joy when we will be with the Lord Jesus. I see our life like climbing up a high mountain and after getting to the top, finally taking off our heavy backpacks, taking all the heaviness off once and for all, the joy that has filled my heart, I can't even put it into words. Wow. This tribal guy coming into a reality, a guy that, that's the guy with the boils on his back, the guy we talked about the other day. Here's another thing I would say was a takeaway for the Basodios, spurred on to godly living and keeping eternity in view. That's what they were focused on as they went through the book of Revelation. And I was reminded of something that Steve Shure said in his book, False Guilt. How do we live the Christian life? Let's think about it, really, day in and day out, day in and day out. He said something at the beginning of his book called False Guilt that really captured my attention when he said this. Oh, sorry. Um, I need to cover this verse here first. This is one of the things that... The, excited the Basodius. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The Basodius know, man, we're going to give an account to the Lord Jesus. And we already know how the story ends. We win with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the thing I was going to say about being inspired to greater faithful witness was Steve Shore said this, many of us live as if nothing decisive happened at the cross. Man, we are more than conquerors in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're weak and frail and we need boldness, then we need to bathe our minds in truth. There's so many voices out there clamoring for our attention. Isn't it true? And yet the Basidio is, again, inspired by the truth of the Lord Jesus. We're going to see him one day. We're going to give an account, every last one of us, to the Lord Jesus Christ of how we lived our lives for ourselves or for him and for others, sharing the gospel, building up believers, equipping others, humbly serving them for his glory and the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ. As the Basodios were hearing and as they talked and discussed, as the scripture says, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And as the Basodios pondered and we talked about these truths and these principles, it even uh, stirred them up to plan more times of witnessing to their children, to their family members, getting the gospel out to others that they know have not yet heard because they know that the Lord Jesus will indeed and is indeed coming again. And that needs to be a present hope that is buried in our hearts, saturating what you and I are doing day in and day out. Well, time, um, yeah, I don't have time to go into the details there, but what a delight that was in teaching the entire book of Revelation not, not that long ago to the Basodios. After that, during that same time, we had graduates that came from the Missionary Training Center. These three gentlemen came over to explore New Guinea before they brought their wives and children to New Guinea. So one of the places that they came to was our village, where the Basodios were. And they got to meet firsthand Tutuama, Maile, and Namolia. Now they're meeting the Basodio pastors, real life flesh and blood, no longer a PowerPoint. Man, they had their cameras going, they had their iPhones out. Hours of recording conversation. We spent two days just Q&A, Q&A, Q&A. And so they wanted to just pepper the Basodios with questions. And the Basodios started way back here of what it was like living in Satan's kingdom well before the missionaries ever came. And the unbelievable transformation that has taken place over time through the truth of the gospel. I even heard stories from the Basodios I didn't even know or had heard before. So it was pretty cool. Of course, as the Basodios talked in Basodia, we had to translate in English. As the missionary, these guys had graduated in English, we had to go. So it took a little while to get through things. But they had those iPhones popping. So they gave me, I've transcribed much of what was said. So as they visited with the Basodio pastors, Here's one thing that the Basodios said, and this goes right with the theme. They challenged these guys, that is the Basodio pastor said to the missionary candidates, what are you seeking? Why have you come here? Pretty bold. So they said, well, 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 well. <laughs> well, we want to come and serve as missionaries. Okay, that's great. Praise God. But here's what they said. If you're going to come, you come fully persuaded that you're going to stay until you finish. Come to finish. And in essence, to submit, they said, if you're not prepared to finish, don't even bother coming. Because we can tell you different ones that have folded and they weren't committed to the end. And he, they started saying to him, Here's what's going to happen. When the going gets tough, and it will, you're going to think of America, and you're going to cut and run. And then they started naming different ones that have cut and run in their mind because they've heard about others. Now, again, like we said in Sunday school, there are legitimate reasons, medical reasons why people, of course. But there's also conflict and different things that come, and the race doesn't get finished, and the task doesn't get completed. And so 
I transcribed for you guys right off the iPhone, right out of their mouths, some of the stuff they said to these guys so you could kind of eavesdrop into that conversation. So here's what they said, in part. <coughs> Excuse me. We stop at 11.30, is that right? Okay. How many songs are you doing at the end? One? Okay. <laughs> Here's what they said. If some of our brothers come here to work in Papua New Guinea, in coming to work, they need to be careful of self-confident thoughts that they may sometimes have in their own hearts, thinking, for example, we know how to do various things in our own strength. We know how to drive cars. We know how to acquire goods. We can all typically be self-confident like that. For us in Papua New Guinea, it may be in regards to other things. Our self-confidence may be in knowing how to make gardens or painting for gold. But that kind of self-confidence, we cannot do God's work well. We doers of God's work are to be humble men, nobodies. We must be thinking straightly like this. When Jesus came to this ground, he was one who had complete understanding. In fact, he was God. But having humbled himself, he came down, and so he was here as a regular man. Who's the model for the Basodios? The Lord Jesus Christ, the incredible humility of Christ, the condescension of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not hold equality with God a thing to be grasped, but left that all behind, and that's what they kept talking about having taken off his heavenly body and his big name and having come to the ground as a regular man, as a nobody, he was inside a regular woman's womb. He thought, later it will be the case that people must attentively observe that which I will be doing. And so having made himself of no account, he became a small child so that he could be born by a regular woman and thus be here as a regular man. And he lowered his name too. And so he was here in the appearance as a nobody. And so he went on living humbly like that. The Basodias always talk about two things that will take them out of ministry, and that's pride and lust. And they constantly remind each other, hey, come on, the way down is those two pathways. Humility is the path that the Lord Jesus is going to lead us on. <clears throat> And so they go on and say, the life, the model for living is Jesus. So in coming to work in Papua New Guinea, that is the one life principle to follow. First, taking off, and they use a verb which meant to disrobe, the way you are used to doing things in America. Don't come here like an American, is what they were saying. <clears throat> then having come here to Papua New Guinea, then you will be ready to work to see your fellow man redeemed by God. Wow, I'm reading this. And guys, there's so much more on side of these iPhones. I got the whole thing. Just their humility. So there was a, <clears throat> these guys had come, and they, the Basodios, are listening to these testimonies. And there was a guy who was part of the missions committee who had also followed one of these graduates over to New Guinea. So there was actually four of them. I don't have the fourth picture up there. But the guy was from a church. <clears throat> it's either Oregon, or I think it was Oregon. And he was on the missions committee, a dear, dear, dear man of God. And so as they're going around sharing stories, this guy's name was Paul. Tsutawama, the Basodio pastor, says to Paul, and what about you? What are you doing with your life? <laughs> so the guy says, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> It turns out this guy's wife was excited that he was going to New Guinea because the wife wants to do mission work. But the husband's not so persuaded. Tears welling up in his eyes. And the guy just opened his heart, humble, confessed, you know what? Man, I just got a new job. Man, I get, we just bought a new beautiful house. Man, I'm struggling. And he's just laying it out to the Basodias. And so, after he shares this inner wrestling, just raw vulnerability with these dear tribal people, Tutuama says, let me pray for you. 
Wow. So, of course, he starts praying in Basodio. And he's praying that God would help him to live with eternity in view. And he said, Lord, help our brother not to be lusting after the things of the ground. Wow. And in all sincerity, they loved up on this guy and just cried out for God's mercy because they knew the brother was struggling. And they weren't sure what God had for that brother. Who knows? That's something between him and his wife to figure out. But <clears throat> the Basodias were impacting this mission committee guy. <laughs> it was really cool. So anyway, um, these missionary graduates, and I'm going to close with some final thoughts here. They said, do you have any word for American churches? So they said, yeah, we do. So that's part of what I want to close with. Here's what they said to just American churches in general. The Basodio said this, and I pulled off a few quotes. Tutuama said this, My brothers and sisters of America, you cannot be living as though you are leftovers, as if you are extras standing idly by with nothing to do in regards to reaching the lost. Man, a good, healthy challenge. And again, they don't know. They're just sent talking to churches in America in general. But we're in this together, in other words. And then Miley, you may be, remember Miley. I shared about him with his feet, the guy that for decades has been walking up and down mountains, discipling believers, taking the gospel to other ways, just a humble, he's a man of few possessions, a man of few possessions. But I took it right off the iPhone. Here's a quote from Miley. <clears throat> the various and sundry material things of America that are in your care should not have control over you, but rather you should think that the main important thing is the fact that my fellow man has not yet heard God's talk, and I need to help them. He went on and he said this, Yes, living in the land of Papua New Guinea is very difficult. You living in America have life somewhat nicer, and you have many various things, but you cannot allow yourself to be like living inside a prison regarding such a life and many things. You in America have very many material things. You have money and cars and various things, but you cannot be placing your confidence in those things or be lusting after them. But rather consider if whether you are thirsting for obeying God's word like you would thirst for water. And the Basudias know an awful lot about being thirsty. And then Miley closed his thoughts like this. I am saying these things to strengthen you and to help you. I am saying these things to strengthen you, but you too help us by praying for us here in Papua New Guinea as we work together in this difficult work. And we too, in helping you, will pray for you so that you will do God's work well. And when all the people in all the corners of the world have finally heard God's talk, and after Jesus comes for us again, and we are all finally together in heaven, what a wonderful indescribable time that will be. You know, Miley and his team over there are living with eternity in view. And I'll tell you what, I think the Basodias would see, hey, you guys are in. Peaceful Valley is in. They're all in. Because every time I come here, I sense that you two, like the Basodias, are living with that end picture that the Lord Jesus is working even to the present hour, that this is his goal and we're going to be singing around that throne together with the Basodios and the ones that, other ones that you support that are reaching different people groups and even the local ones right here in this area around that throne from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's why we exist. That's why God is using the church to call out for a people for his name. completing, finishing the race, completing the task. I want to close just with a couple of thoughts here. And I thought about this. I thought, you know what? Two more things. Tsuduwama, the Basodio pastor, the one that said, this isn't heaven. Do you remember that from the other night? When he was told to stop, to take it easy, he had suffered so much in his itinerant ministry. I've seen Tsuduwama being so sick, having boils, having lost a ton of weight, still walk in the mountains like this to take others the gospel. 
just like that. And they're saying, take a break, take a break, take a break. That's the context where he says, look, this isn't heaven. We'll have plenty of time to rest later. For now, man, we're to be about what the Lord Jesus has called us to until he comes again. And so he's actually crafted a message for the students that I share with the students. And I thought, you know what? The message he shares with the missionary candidates in training is actually something you and I could benefit from hearing about finishing. And in the spirit of 1 Corinthians 16, 13, where Paul says to the church, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. In that spirit, here's what Sudawa said to the missionary candidates in training in Missouri. Don't turn back from the work which you are learning about and being strengthened in. Do not turn back from the work which God has given you to do. Be strong. If you give up and turn back and do not go tell those who've never heard, then who will go tell them? Those people will continue living in their total sin debt, but so that they can be forgiven and free from their sin debt, they must be told God's word. Be strong in continuing to do that work of God. And I believe that's the message he has for you and for me. The message of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. The other night I closed with Maui Ba, and some of you weren't here, so I'm just going to share this. This is the last quote from the Basodios. In the advertisement video, whatever you showed there about people coming to the conference, um, there was something I said in the language. Well, here's what it was. It was a quote from Mauiba, and Mauiba said this to us. When you first arrived among us, if I would have known that this was the message you had come to proclaim to us, I would have taught you our language day and night, day and night, so that we could have heard it all the sooner. Guys, you and I need to be persuaded. It is the best news. I was going to say the goodest, but that's probably not even a word. <laughs> Guys, the good news. Let's be fully persuaded, and if we're not fully persuaded, let's cry out to God for mercy, that he would persuade us that the news that he's given us is the best news anyone's ever going to hear about anything, the side of eternity. Well, I'm going to close right now, and I'm going to... Well, I'm not going to ask Harriet. You, we don't have time for that song. We'll have to give that a miss. Next time, sweetie. All right. <laughs> Guys, thank you so, so much for your incredible generosity, for the warm fellowship, and just for the life of Christ that we see in you guys. And I'm not just saying that as a token thing. You guys have refreshed our own hearts many, many times. You've had an intimate impact on the Basodio people, to say the least, not to mention the other works and very uh, good and wonderful ministries that you guys have supported throughout the years. I just pray that your model here as a light on the hill will be a model for other churches. Thanks very much.